the joint hearing of the Capital Investment and Housing Finance and Policy Committee for January 23rd is called to order. Just want to say thank, uh, welcome, Chair Howard and the Housing Committee for joining us today uh, for us to get a presentation from Commissioner Ho and the Minnesota Housing Finance Agency on the different type of uh, types of bonds that will be uh, authorizing this legislature uh, as we consider authorizing this legislature this year. Uh, the other, you know, one of them will be the housing infrastructure bonds, HIBs, and then the other one will be for uh, public housing rehabilitation. With that, I'll turn it over to Chair Howard. Thank you, Chair Lee, and thank you to the members of the Housing Finance Committee and the Capital Investment Committee. Uh, I really appreciate Chair Lee's uh, idea to get us together and any chance we can get to kind of get out of the little silos of our committees, especially where there are intersections to our work, uh, make a ton of sense. And in the area of housing, I can't think of a better uh, joint hearing uh, to have uh, because of the opportunity we have in both of our committees and together uh, to, to do some really important, meaningful work this year in housing. And so I'm just really looking forward to this hearing. And it's really nice to be here with some members that I don't normally see on some of my committees. And so uh, just really look forward to the discussion today. And with that, we're kind of yeah, sorting this out, this joint hearing. I was just asking him to, protocol. Yes. yes. <laughs> so uh, first, we have a presentation. Uh, and I'm going to uh, have the, the pleasure of welcoming Commissioner Ho to the committee. Chairs Lee and Howard, members of the committees. Uh, my name is Jennifer Ho, and I have the pleasure of being the Commissioner of Minnesota Housing. Uh, I am here today with Dan Kitzberger. He is my legislative director. And uh, you will see him uh, very frequently at all of your uh, committee meetings, even when I'm not there. I uh, look forward to having an opportunity to have one-on-one -on -one time uh, with each of you. I, um, uh, and for those of you who I've, I've known from the past, it's great to see you again. And for members that are newer, at least to me, I look forward to getting an opportunity to get to know you. I, um, you know, obviously, the, the work of Minnesota Housing brings together financing from many different places. I, um, but our housing bond work is, is very near and dear to the agency, and it really is a standout for Minnesota uh, when I talk to my colleagues across the country. A couple of things, uh, either to remind you or if you're, if you're new um, to the legislature or to these committees, uh, Minnesota Housing is a mission-driven financial institution. I call us the state's housing bank. I, um, <clears throat> we're one of the leading state housing finance agencies in the country. Um, uh, do an incredible amount of home homeownership lending. Uh, we were created uh, with the authority from the Congress and the Treasury to issue bonds to support both homeownership and the rental market. Therefore, we are rated by the rating agencies. Uh, we have a, a AA plus bond rating. I, um, it's uh, very important uh, because we issue bonds and service bondholders uh, that we run a tight ship at Minnesota Housing. That our um, our management of these of these resources is, is very important to us. But our partnership with the legislature uh, is another thing that makes us very unique. Uh, I'm able to do things that other housing finance agencies can't do because they're simply touching HUD dollars, issuing bonds, and touching the low-income housing tax credit. We do so many things together with you that it lets us do more than some of our colleagues. I, um, I think, uh, you know, I think you know from your constituents, you know from your work, that housing is an area that is increasingly a challenge for Minnesotans uh, all across the state. Uh, we have almost 600,000 households in Minnesota that pay more than 30% of their income uh, for housing. 30% has long been the federal standard. 79% um, of extremely low-income Minnesota renters are cost burdened, meaning they pay way too much of their income for rent and therefore can't afford the other things they need. We actually have uh, over 180,000 renting households of kind of prime home buying age between 25 and 44 who have the income to purchase a home, but they don't have access to the bank of mom and dad or another resource to help them uh, with the asset to get into home ownership. Uh, for some time now, we've had a limited supply of single family homes for sale. 
especially homes that are selling uh, at 250,000 or less. <coughs> and the greatest challenge to homelessness on any given night, roughly 8,000 people are sleeping in shelters or outdoors. Uh, you know, I think the, the key to thinking about um, this is we have a supply problem. Uh, we don't have enough um, rental units. But even where we do dedicated units that are affordable to people who make the least, um, you don't have to give up that unit when you make more. In fact, that's how we get ahead. And so the supply issue impacts the market across the board, but the impacts are hardest for the people who make the least. I, um, I mean, I have been so struck in my four years as the commissioner traveling around the state. There's not a single community that I travel to. I was up in War Road this summer. Um, I, you know, I was talking to a commissioner from Rochester. Uh, I was up in Grand Portage this fall. It doesn't matter if I'm in Worthington or the suburbs or the cities. There's no part of our state today that isn't impacted uh, by uh, the lack of housing, the number of people that are paying more than they can afford on rent. I, uh, so in most of the state, one in four households pay 30% or more of their income, as kind of demonstrated by this, by this map. I think we all know that Minnesota has some of the worst home ownership disparities, especially between black and white households. Uh, this shows uh, the disparities uh, by race and ethnicity. And um, it, is, it is certainly a legacy problem. Uh, but also one that, uh, with targeted resources, one which we believe that we can make gains against. Um, disparities in, in homelessness are really staggering. Uh, uh, people who are indigenous are 32 times as likely to experience homelessness compared to their white counterparts. It's in the Star Tribune and headlines uh, again today. Uh, evictions um, have risen uh, back to uh, not just pre-pandemic levels, but, but higher than pre-pandemic levels and are persisting uh, at those very high levels. We have a lot of renters who are hurting. So as Chair Lee said, the two uh, bonding items that we come to the Capitol and talk about are housing infrastructure bonds and public housing preservation bonds. The housing infrastructure bonds are appropriations bonds. The public housing preservation bonds are geo bonds. I want to talk about housing infrastructure bonds first. Housing infrastructure bonds were created with a recognition that housing is a part of our critical infrastructure and that it needs to be attended as such. I, uh, it was responding to the fact that 95% of all housing in the state is privately owned but state general obligation bonds can only be used for publicly owned housing. So it was a mismatch to use geo bonds for what it was that we could do broadly in the, in the housing community. So they were created back in 2012 and since have become the largest source of state capital for housing development. And again, as I mentioned, uh, they're unique and frankly, uh, a bit coveted uh, when I talk to my colleagues uh, in other parts of the country. I think the other thing that's important to know is that when we apply housing infrastructure bonds to a project, we are often leveraging considerable amounts of local, federal, and private investment in order to spur development that otherwise wouldn't happen. The purposes for housing uh, infrastructure bonds, uh, the original purpose was to develop and preserve permanent supportive housing. Permanent supportive housing is the proven intervention to help people, even with the longest histories of homelessness, succeed in housing. It allows us to preserve federally assisted housing, which is really important because where we have federal dollars coming into these properties to keep the rents low, we don't want uh, those properties to fall out of use or for uh, owners to sell them and for them to no longer bring in those critical federal dollars. Uh, it allows us to create affordable housing for seniors. It always makes me smile when I say seniors aged 55 and older 
I guess I'm speaking to you today as a senior. I, um, <clears throat> that was a new use uh, back in 2018. Um, and there is a statutory preference in the language for units at 30% of area median income and below. We're able, also new in 2018, uh, to help manufactured home community uh, co-op acquisition, for example. We've been involved in several uh, instances where the residents of a manufactured home community purchased the community from a previous private owner. And we're also using housing infrastructure bonds for very critical infrastructure investments in uh, water, uh, sewer, uh, oftentimes roads that are in such horrible disrepair that the school bus won't drive in to pick up kids and the garbage trucks won't drive in to pick up the trash. People have to uh, send their kids and their trash all the way to the main street to get picked up. Uh, that's been a very exciting uh, area for the agency over the last four years. And then in 2020, uh, there was an expanded use for single family homes and townhomes. Um, and we have found that that works best uh, in the work of community land trusts. And we have quite a few community land trusts around the state. There is a new uh, proposed use in 2023, uh, recognizing that there are lots of Minnesotans who are very low income, but they're not homeless. They don't need supportive services. They don't need supportive housing. Uh, so I believe uh, this committee will discuss uh, the proposal to make housing infrastructure bonds available for people making less than 50% of the area median income. Uh, the governor and I are in support of that expanded use. If you take a look at our history since 2012, uh, over a half a billion in housing infrastructure bonds have been authorized. Uh, and those... Um, have leveraged over a billion dollars of total development cost. More than 6,400 units have been created or preserved, including units that are currently in the pipeline. And they really have been a critical uh, source for households, uh, the very lowest income households at 30%, very median income and below, uh, with a special emphasis on permanent supportive housing and uh, new construction for seniors. I have enjoyed uh, going to the grand openings of both types of those projects and meeting the residents that are benefiting from those. Um, right now, um, I'll anticipate a question. We have 39.6 million of housing infrastructure bonds that are authorized but not issued. Um, from the 100 million authorization in 2020, Partly that's because in 2020, we were asked to set aside some for single family and for manufactured housing, and to have that set aside last for five years. And, uh, and uh, some of it is for projects where they're um, just not quite shovel ready yet, and anything else uh, should be allocated this fall. So there's not, um, there's not some that, don't, that are wandering, out, wandering around without a place to go. Uh, they all uh, have been attached to work. I, um, let me just walk through the timeline. Uh, the agency runs a, uh, an annual consolidated RFP process on both our multifamily and our single family side. I, um, uh, we're open right now for, uh, for technical assistance and outreach. We're talking to people, uh, cities, developers, uh, people who are interested in using any of the agency's resources. In April, uh, our request for funding process opens, and in July, the application period closes. The nice thing about that is usually in May or June, hopefully this year, May, uh, we actually know how much is available. So developers know um, if we have a lot of housing infrastructure bonds. So for example, if you're doing a senior housing project or a permanent supportive housing project, uh, you know you want to get something into our, um, our funding round in July. Uh, we review applications, take them to the board uh, in December. I don't know if I mentioned, I have an independent board of directors. Um, and then uh, select them in December, and we begin project underwriting and due diligence, uh, and oftentimes can issue bonds in the fall of the next year uh, and begin to uh, get the ground break uh, on some of these projects. In 2022, um, first of all, we, we receive proposals that are far in excess of the funding that we have available each year. Perhaps uh, this will be the last year I need to say that as just kind of a constant note. 
Um, we didn't have a bonding bill uh, last year. Uh, we didn't get housing infrastructure bonds, so we were able to do fewer uh, than we're usually able to do when we do have housing infrastructure bonds. So just as a, a point of comparison, in our selections last December, we had 752 total units compared to um, the previous year, we did 1,545 units when we did have a housing infrastructure bond allocation. So in the 22 RFP selections, we had single family development, 4.4 million for 14 proposals, um, including uh, 63 community land trust homes, manufactured housing, 7.7 .7 million in seven proposals, supporting 515 manufactured home community lots. And on the rental side, we were able to do two proposals for supportive housing, that's 88 units, and we did a preservation deal of 86 units. Looking back from 2012 through 2021, you can see it's multifamily new construction. You can see uh, what it leverages, a multifamily rehab and preservation. Um, a significant number of those units, uh, you can see how much we've done and what it leverages. Single family, 422 homes, and manufactured homes, uh, 895 lots. That's a total of six. 1,358 total units of housing with housing infrastructure bonds. Uh, the precise number, 518.6 million, and that's the precise number of leverage. I just want to highlight a project. I, um, for folks that aren't uh, very familiar with supportive housing, I mean, it really is uh, kind of like assisted living, but for people uh, with long histories of homelessness who may have behavioral health challenges, chronic health conditions, uh, mental illness, where having supports makes the housing work and having the housing makes the services work. This is actually an area that I was up at the Capitol a lot during the 2000s. Uh, not only does it uh, prove effective to, to keep people housed with very long histories of homelessness, but it also turns out that it's a much better use of public investment when people are homeless. We spend a lot of money on crisis and emergency services, people, things that are very expensive, without getting a better outcome when we invest in housing. We're still investing in things, but it's like doctor and medicine. And we're also better able to leverage uh, federal funding. People get on Social Security. They're on Medicaid. Uh, we have the opportunity to tap, oftentimes, HUD housing resources. So supportive housing is recognized nationally as, a, uh, as an innovation, a proven innovation. And so we can do that. This is just a qu quote from Carol Priest at Red Lake. Red Lake Supportive Housing is starting construction uh, this year for 28 additional units of supportive housing built as twin homes and duplexes with one to three bedrooms per unit. It's located near two new service centers so that the services will be uh, very available uh, to the, the residents of the supportive housing and it's being developed by Red Lake Housing. An example of a single family project, one of the uh, selections that we highlighted in December is a partnership between Itasca County HRA and One Roof Community Housing. Um, they are going to create a community land trust in order to create permanent affordable home ownership opportunities using housing infrastructure bonds for the one-time investment in the purchase of a land and underwriting of the construction. I um, just uh, a quote uh, next from a family that's benefited from other One Roof uh, community land trust models, uh, just talking about how the opportunity to get into a home can help a family go from paycheck to paycheck to really having an opportunity to finally get ahead. And in the land trust model, you know, affordability is kind of built in so that it carries over for future owners of that home as well. Just another uh, project to help you see housing infrastructure bonds in action. Another one of the projects that we just selected in December is a manufactured home community in Moorhead called Bennett Park Cooperative. It's a 22 lot manufactured home community, provides <coughs> some of the most affordable housing in the, in the Moorhead community, but the community has pretty significant infrastructure needs. So we're doing sewer pipes, water mains, um, reconstructing the parking lot and the roads in order to make this a community that can be viable for years to come. And then again, just a quote from one of the uh, board members and residents up at Bennett Park about how important it is uh, to be able to have pride uh, in the health and safety and quality of the community for folks live. I, um, you know, I think it's just really important to appreciate that there really hasn't been a state vehicle for doing these investments. 
in manufactured home communities until the last four years. And as word gets out, we're seeing an increased number of communities uh, appreciate what it is that we can do with these dollars. So we expect to see um, uh, growth in the number of applications and our opportunity to make investments in future years. That's housing infrastructure bonds. Uh, chairs, I can either pause to talk about housing infrastructure bonds or push right through to public housing preservation and take questions all together at the end. Commissioner, uh, why don't we keep going and, and then we'll go to questions at the end. Uh, thank you, Chair Howard. So public housing preservation. Um, these are state general obligation bonds uh, because public housing, a part of the public housing authority and HUD infrastructure is government owned, publicly owned. So it, it's been a good fit with the with GEO bonds. Uh, Shannon's here, so she'll let me know if I've got any of my numbers uh, not quite right, but public housing serves about 36,000 low-income households throughout the state. Uh, that includes uh, 12,000 kids, a high percentage of uh, seniors and individuals who are living with disabilities. About 65% of the residents of public housing have incomes of less than $15,000 per year. These are folks that are on fixed incomes. More than 95% of public housing in our state is 35 years or older. I, um, and I can, um, you know, actually had the opportunity to go tour an installation of a fire suppression system in the Hiawatha Towers in Minneapolis um, last week. Uh, it's, it's amazing to just um, see what it takes to get a high rise uh, up to kind of modern technology in terms of sprinkler systems and all the automation uh, that occurs around that. But this has been really, really important for us to invest in this fundamental health and safety um, uh, parts of housing. Uh, you know, HUD really stepped away from its obligation to the built public housing portfolio, and it has been undercapitalized uh, for decades. And so the state geo bonds are an opportunity for us to preserve and improve these units because they are a critical part of the infrastructure. And for those of you who, um, who have small towns uh, across greater Minnesota in your district, it's probably the tallest high rise in your community. Uh, it would be a HUD public housing project. And we're there to do boilers and asphalt repair and critical health and infrastructure in those. Going back to 2012, uh, you can see the amounts uh, that were authorized and awarded uh, by the legislature. Um, our biggest year was 2014 at 20 million. The last time we received it was 16 million, 16 million in 2020. So in total, 61 and a half million of, of POP authorized over those um, five years, uh, 116 projects serving over 8,600 units. Um, and again, some really basic infrastructure repair, but also an opportunity oftentimes to dramatically improve the quality of life for the residents in the building, as well as for the, uh, the neighborhood around it. I think we were in Lesur uh, last summer, and the Lesur Public Housing Authority has one building, that's the Lesur Public Housing Authority. But we were able to take a completely uh, uh, rundown and dangerous outside kind of ironworks uh, deck and stairs system that had become just a horrible safety hazard, refacade, redo, uh, redo the flow of water so it wasn't flooding inside. A beautiful project, and that's great not only for the residents, got to meet a couple of them, but for the whole surrounding community. So excited that to see that. Uh, here's a, a project uh, in Laverne from 2018, almost $600 million of, of public housing preservation, geo bonds, seven story, 70 unit development that was able to make the building uh, accessible. Here you see the before picture of somebody trying to get into the building who uses a wheelchair before it was done and uh, get the investments done. We now have an ADA accessible building that also uh, improves safety as well as the longevity of the building. So you can see the range of things that we did there. Here's a number, another example uh, just here in St. Paul, the Wabasha High Rise. Uh, it's a six-story high-rise that was built in 1969. It's owned by the St. Paul PHA. 70 units, uh, both efficiencies and one bedrooms, uh, serving a very diverse group of low-income individuals. You can see uh, that, it, uh, that the 
outside exterior was uh, falling apart on the building, and uh, which made it more dangerous for folks who lived there, but also for folks who were just walking by. And we were able to help invest in the improvements to that. So I'd like to end all my presentations. If you have any hard questions, please call my legislative director, Dan Kitzberger. He'd be happy to help you out. And uh, with that, we would both be happy to take uh, any questions that you might have. Thank you for the opportunity to walk through our bonding programs. Thank you, Commissioner and Mr. Kitzberger. Uh, are there questions for members? Representative Erdahl. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and the Commissioner. Uh, first of all, thank you for coming into my district and viewing a couple of housing projects. Uh, those are you know, important parts of, of our community. Uh, you know, obviously there still is the, the shortage. Um, you know, Litchfield is uh, trying to expand their businesses, but there's no place for people to live. Um, one of the uh, concerns that I have, which was brought to me by uh, a uh, governmental entity that was trying to uh, uh, promote a, a couple of housing projects, is that they couldn't do them uh, because of the cost overrun, which was generally brought about uh, through prevailing wage. And uh, I had I've been talking to uh, uh, some folks in that uh, industry about you know, what can be done in situations like that, where the project can't even be done because they can't afford to pay, to pay the prevailing wage rate. Uh, any uh, thoughts on that? Commissioner Ho. Uh, Chairs and Representative Erdahl, thank you for the question. And, um, and yes, I did enjoy both going to see something that was just getting ready to open as well as breaking ground on a project in your district. That was fun to do. I um, uh, Obviously, prevailing wage is uh, under the uh, oversight of my colleagues over at the Department of Labor and Industry. But what we also have heard is that, especially for folks who are trying to do single family construction, uh, that getting contractors to bid on single family projects in greater Minnesota can be very difficult. And that, um, uh, and so that they're concerned that it, that it is something that, that is an obstacle to development and that it impacts some communities more than others, depending on what the geography is uh, that sets prevailing wage for that region. So certainly uh, a conversation that that I've had with the legislature over the last couple of sessions, but it's something that's in the purview of my friends over at the Department of Labor and Industry. But we certainly do uh, relay over to Dolly uh, when we have developers who are having problems uh, with deals. What I will also say is that we've had very, very few deals, unfortunately, but realistically, over the course of the last year or two, that have been able to come in on time and on budget because of all the cost pressures uh, in the development market right now. And you know what I'm pleased to say is in terms of projects that Minnesota Housing has selected, uh, we've had a couple close calls, um, but we have not had a single project that we couldn't uh, get to closing. And so oftentimes that's a partnership with all the funders in the deal to figure out how to deal with the rising cost pressures on both uh, labor shortages, construction materials, uh, and just time. I mean, time is a driver of costs, especially in this interest rate environment. But I appreciate that that, that is something that developers, especially single family developers in greater Minnesota have brought to our attention. Follow up, Representative Erdahl. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, appreciate those comments. Commissioner, I would just ask that you raise this in your, in your priority a little more and you know try talking to some of the powers that be about doing something in this area. Uh, it doesn't do the construction industry any good or their workers any good if they can't get work because they can't be they can't afford to have them there. So appreciate if you could continue working on that. Representative Hansen. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Commissioner. Good to see you again. Good to see you too. Um, my question is a little bit different, and you know I'm just wondering on applicability. I look around communities and we have uh, some schools that may no longer be used or we have churches that are no longer used and you know the buildings have good bones um, and could they could you use you know they're they're currently might be in public the public realm like a school district um, 
but could you use the infrastructure bonds to remodel a, a, a school building into housing? Could you remodel a, a church into housing? Um, many of the churches have kitchens, etc., in them, uh, classrooms. Uh, so I'm just throwing that out there. I don't know if it's a if it's something where we have to look in the uh, infrastructure bonds or if it's a tax credit or some way of looking at it, but it seems like we have infrastructure out there that can be repurposed. Commissioner Hall. Uh, Chair and, and Representative, I'm just going to try to get my angle right so I can uh, see you. Uh, we have actually done projects that have been old school conversions. I remember one actually from long before my time as commissioner uh, up on the range. I think we have another one happening up in International Falls right now, uh, which are both school uh, projects. Uh, oftentimes the bones are good, uh, but where the plumbing is and how it runs matters. So, so it's nice in an elementary school where you got uh, plumbing running to every room oftentimes. Um, sometimes in a church, uh, the plumbing is more centralized, so it's a much larger piece. But an adaptive reuse is what we would usually call it. And it certainly is eligible across uh, quite a number of our funding streams. And how it's going to be used would be the main reason for whether or not it qualified for housing infrastructure bonds. So if you did it as supportive housing, for example, or if you did it as senior housing, um, quite a few uh, nursing home conversions that have been done to permanent supportive housing. I, um, uh, I'll have to go back and, and stump the team on whether we've done a church. I, I, I can't think of one, but we've certainly done land adjacent to a church as a, a prime place for a new housing development when the church has either offered, uh, supported, or donated the land to a developer. So I don't think that there's anything, uh, uh, Dan, uh, Dan and Ryan can check as to whether there's anything that would need to change in the housing infrastructure bond authorizing language. I think as long as it was one of the uses that was allowed, we'd be good. Representative West. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I just want to say thank you for highlighting a manufactured housing community in one of your uh, pitches here. That is going to be key, is building out more manufactured housing going forward. I don't think we're going to be able to single family build our way out of this. And a lot of communities don't necessarily want giant apartment buildings every square block. Uh, my questions around manufactured housing is, what are the biggest barriers you're seeing to that being built out? And is there anything the legislature can do to help that happen? And particularly, something that's equitable to both the co-ops and the privately owned parks, because we need both of them to really get that going. Commissioner Ho. Uh, Chair and Representative West, uh, thank you for that. And we do support uh, infrastructure in privately owned manufactured home communities as well. And I think some of the challenges are uh, many manufactured home communities were built outside of city limits and not on city infrastructure. So they have their own wells, they have their own sewer, um, and they're not tied into uh, city water and sewer. And so they don't have the benefit of kind of the, the, the public health oversight and the, and the capital upgrades to keep those things working well. Uh, the project that we did recently, Chair Howard, in your district, um, the water was running brown out of the taps. Um, and uh, with uh, our infrastructure investment, they're going to get connected to City of Richfield water, for example. So I think challenge number one is a lot of folks, uh, these, these places are, are set outside of city limits, and so it's, it's kind of a no man's land when it comes to the utility piece. I think uh, we, have, uh, we have great private owners uh, that are great partners with their residents. We have some uh, corporate out-of-state owners that are trying to price gouge their, their residents. We're seeing some communities where lot rents are skyrocketing, and there's a lot of additional fees that are being placed on residents. And for residents, especially in older manufactured homes, it is very expensive to contemplate the idea of relocating to another community that has a lower lot rent. Uh, the agency has, uh, in, our, in our home rehab program, adopted the ability to repair or replace a manufactured home uh, for a homeowner that has health and safety needs in that specific home. So that's another way that we're able to, to work with communities. I think for us and for uh, the manufactured home communities generally, I think it's just getting used to the idea that the state is making consistent year over year investments in these things and making sure that people understand it, but also because a lot of these private owners of manufactured home communities aren't used to getting investments uh, from government. They also have to get used to the fact that if they say they're going to make an improvement, 
that costs a certain amount, that we're going to look at their plans, we're going to look at their engineering, uh, we're going to look at, at making sure that that, that work gets done uh, to, to, to good quality standards. And oftentimes that is done um, in partnership with the city um, or, or nearest city to make that happen. So I think this is, there's a world of opportunity here. And, um, you know, it's interesting, uh, when I became the housing commissioner, it's like you travel around the state with a different set of eyes I, um, and see these communities all over the place. We were just up at the Roseville Fire Department and as we pulled out, saw you know, a large manufactured home community right adjacent to um, the city hall. So, I mean, it's, you know, it's certainly something that is a very important part of our affordable housing infrastructure in an area where uh, I have created a dedicated staff person uh, and you know, we've got the resources that we need. We have partnerships with the other state agencies that are involved in manufactured home communities. I see this as an area where the agency should only be doing more. Sorry for that long answer. Paul, Person West. Uh, just really quickly, uh, I'm very glad to hear that. Uh, the one thing I feel private owners can kind of get lumped in with the bad apples and it's and we want to make sure that we're encouraging that kind of investment, whereas with co-ops frequently we see it's hard to get people to vote, basically, to increase costs on them when they need to make improvements. So just like with a bad owner, we have co-ops that, that let their places fall apart. And that's where sometimes I feel private owners get unfairly dinged because there's other private owners that are just, I mean, some of them must be total scumbags. But just making sure that's equitable, I think, is a good plan because both have problems, but I think the path forward is making sure both are well supported. But glad to hear it. Thank you. Representative Johnson. Uh, Chair Howard, Commissioner, uh, thank you for being here today. Well, you, a couple things I want to talk about is one with the manufactured homes and also modular homes. Um, in, I know in my community and my surrounding communities, most of our manufactured home parks are in town. They're not out in the country. I have, in my entire district, I have w one out of six that are not in the city limits. And I look around my surrounding counties as well, and there's only one other one that I can think of that's not in the city limits. Now, the problem we have with those uh, facilities is because it was privately put together, the water and sewer infrastructure is not compatible with the uh, city stuff. And it's very expensive to switch it over to go to a co-op type deal because who's responsible for if, if the PVC water main breaks, is it gonna be the city or is it gonna be the co-op? Because it's a, those things are privately owned. Um, so that's some, something that we gotta look at and we're looking for ideas how to do that. I know I just signed on a bill to help cover those costs because it's a huge cost in these areas that want to get to um, privately owned or co-op type as well uh, for the land that the, their modular or manufactured home sits on. But I'd also like to get your idea of how, how modular homes could be used to really work in uh, getting first-time home buyers and low-income low housing put together to it instead of being renting a place or with low income, but actually become a home owner and start getting pride in your home and, and uh, self-respect for themselves and get them uh, more productive. Commissioner Ho. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Representative. I've had the opportunity to tour both um, RISE and Dynamic uh, modular construction and uh, learn more. It's something the agency has been very involved in. In fact, in our competitive process, uh, we actually award points for folks that are d using innovations in technology, also potentially over time reducing the cost of construction uh, by the way that we build when we build things inside. In fact, I think uh, we just opened in partnership with, um, with Malax uh, Corporate Ventures, a modular twin home project in Onamia. Um, that was done by Dynamic Homes and had gone up and toured Dynamic while the build was happening inside of the warehouse there. So we're very supportive of modular as a way to um, streamline. In fact, the uh, Minneapolis Public Housing Authority just announced a very large infill project in the city of Minneapolis where they're gonna do modular um, uh, three and four plexes, uh, 
uh, on some of the scattered site land that's owned by the, the Public Housing Authority. But certainly, uh, we're seeing uh, modular as a way to, um, to streamline construction costs and, boy, in a winter like this one, to be able to do year-round construction inside in a t-shirt. Um, it can be largely beneficial to the folks who build this stuff, too. And it doesn't slow down the production schedule when you're dealing with uh, extreme weather events. So I think there's a great potential. And um, you know, the, the more modular we do, the more modular we can do, because the folks that are creating that, I think somebody's talking about putting a, a modular manufacturing uh, plant in North Minneapolis. Y you have a geography of where it's sufficient to transport to, and you want to have a consistent pipeline so that you never have your um, your your assembly line down. But I think it's I think it's exciting I, uh, for folks who haven't had an opportunity to tour a modular uh, manufacturing plant. I mean it it kind of makes you feel like you're in Legoland for adults. It's very cool to see how they're able to just move literally a home across an assembly line and out the door and onto a truck and out to a site. So I, I think it's very promising. Representative Johnson. Uh, Chair Howard, Commissioner. I myself have toured uh, one or two facilities in, in the past. Um, so I, I think the modular is going to be a way to go, especially with something. In fact, I have a hotel in my district that was a, I can't remember how many rooms they have. It was a modular put together. Um, and then the other thing, two other questions. You talked about your bonding limit and how much you have left. If you could get that back to me, because I didn't get a chance to write it down quick. My, my pen wasn't working. And then also of the public housing funding, that summary that you have of the 116 projects that you've done since 2012. I'm just wondering if we, we can get a breakdown of the number that were publicly owned or privately owned. Commissioner Ho. Uh, thank you, uh, and, and thank you for that question. I, uh, the public housing preservation is 100% publicly owned. It, it needs to, it's geo bonds, it has to by constitution. I, um, so if that question was specifically about the public housing preservation, it's 100% publicly owned. And Dan can follow up with you with the details on the uh, housing infrastructure bonds that haven't been issued yet. But again, those are tied to either the set-asides that were done in 2020 or uh, projects that weren't shovel-ready yet where the bonds will be issued this fall. But we'll follow up with the details of that. There, uh, I am not sitting on a bunch of I don't know what to do with housing infrastructure bonds, I promise. I, um, and if you, if you authorize more, uh, we can attach them to projects uh, depending on how much by the end of this year or at least by the end of this year and next year. And if it's a super lot, at least by the end of this year, next year, and maybe a couple of the year after that, depending on how big big is. Members, we have four members on the list. If you could be succinct, we do have public testifiers in the next presentation, but I think we want to have time for members to ask questions of the commissioner. Uh, so Representative Carroll. Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, you know, and I'll, I'll forego my questions have been uh, answered. I'm glad to see a discussion about manufactured housing. That was my concern. Plymouth has one manufactured housing park. Uh, it stands in stark contrast to the surrounding area. But when you talk to those folks who've lived there, and some of them for 30 and 40 years, they are so happy, they're so grateful, and uh, I want to do whatever we can to support them. The question had to do with what what uh, component does manufactured housing play within the answer to housing? I think you've addressed that, and I won't burden anyone else with that. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I guess mine is more of a, a takeaway from what I'm hearing in this presentation. Earlier on, uh, first of all, uh, there's a RISE manufacturing plant in, in Owatonna. It's, it's a great facility and is very interesting. Um, Earlier we heard about how important it is to actually get into the home ownership issue and about how there's a discrepancy. And yet we see that most of the proposals, especially in later presentations, is all about uh, developing more rental property and more opportunities for, for uh, low income to get shelter uh, in that particular way, which really doesn't help the home ownership uh, piece of it. And matter of fact, even uh, some of the proposals coming in front of uh, housing uh, in talks in regards to uh, reducing the uh, down payment for housing actually promotes higher cost of housing, in which we really need to start thinking about how can we make homes, uh, whether it's duplexes or, or whatever, 
smaller in cost or figure out some way of reducing that because otherwise that discrepancy is always going to continue to be there because we're actually promoting people to staying in, in rental units when we put all of our money towards rental units. Now part of that is trying to figure out how we can make the, the opportunities for manufacturers and builders to make them cheaper. Uh, but also, there's also a government entity issue in which we are creating regulations that are also creating higher costs. And so there has to be some way of us being able to juggle all of those complexities into developing opportunities for actually homes to be at a, at a lower cost. Because if I look at the inflation of homes today compared to inflation of cars, for example, uh, automobiles since their inception, I think housing has grown a whole lot faster than cars uh, with the same pressures. And some of that I think has to do with regulation. Others had to do just with size and other things that we want to do. But I do think that this presentation really reflects the fact that there are much more larger issues here than just about whether or not we provide more housing units. So that's just food for thought, Mr. Chair. If I may, briefly. Yes, Commissioner. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Representative Petersburg. I just uh, remind you that the presentation today was simply about our work on, on bonds. And when you take a look at the whole work of the agency, there's a significant uh, body of work. In fact, most of our outlays are around single family home ownership. Just want to make that point that today we're just talking about bonding. Commissioner Franson, or Representative Franson. Maybe someday. Ooh. Not today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Ms. Uh, Commissioner, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, wondering, just thinking about the, the mobile home parks here, and if I recall, I heard you say that there is funding for privately owned parks for infrastructure. Is that correct? Commissioner Hall. Yes, that is correct. Mr. Chair. Representative Francine. I'm thinking of a specific mobile park that the city of Alexandria has discussed with me and it's privately owned. It appears that the owners don't really want to put any money into the infrastructure on the bottom. Would this be something that the city of Alexandria would be able to apply for funding? The, the owners of the homes don't have the funding for the infrastructure yet it appears what I've been told is that the owner of the park doesn't want to invest either. Commissioner Ho. Uh, Chair Howard, Representative Franz, and I think that is uh, such a unique case. It would be best for us to take it offline so I can make sure that I understand the specifics of it. It would be hard for us to do an infrastructure project if the owner didn't want to do it. I, um, but are there ways in which the owner and the city could partner to do it? I suspect there probably would be. I would have to go back and check with our experts as to whom the applicant would need to be. Okay, thank you. Representative Hussein. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for being here second time and making yourself available to and answering all those questions that you have, you have answered. Uh, my question is following up uh, Representative Rick Hansen about the availability uh, that we have in schools and charge. And uh, I don't think so we'd be able to address the housing crisis overnight. And it will take us uh, quite a bit, but I was thinking, uh, in order for us to address homelessness, can we use for uh, uh, temporary shelters for, you know, uh, to address the homelessness until we are uh, able to find uh, more housing in, in our city and state? And uh, every time we try to address someone uh, from homeless, it's, it's hard to find a shelter because they have a capacity. So can we utilize those? Uh, available and built and have a kitchen and, and ready to go for those people that needs for shelters. Thank you. Commissioner Ho. Uh, Chair and Representative Hussein, um, I just came from an event with uh, the, the governor where we're previewing our housing stability package and have done a lot of conversations uh, both with the Interagency Council on Homelessness but also with Commissioner Harpstead at DHS. And uh, I don't want to steal her thunder, but I think there'll be a robust conversation about capital for shelter out of the Department of Human Services. We wanted to keep DHS focused on shelter and Minnesota housing focused on housing so that we don't have competition for housing dollars and shelter dollars in the same pool. But I do believe it's fair to say there will be a robust conversation about capital for shelter in the human services committees. Lock that line. Commissioner, I just want to thank you for joining us. I know it's been a busy day, uh, but we appreciate you taking the time to, 
to do double or triple duty this week and join us for a joint hearing and, and we'll see you hopefully in the housing committee this week and next week too. Chairs, uh, with the budget coming out, I relish these busy days. I look forward to seeing you more. Thank you very much. Thank you. And with that, I'm going to turn the gavel over to Chair Lee and uh, join the lectern to present the, the bill that we're going to have the hearing on, the information hearing on. Thank you, Chair Howard. And uh, just to represent Hussein's uh, comment and to Commissioner uh, comment too around shelters, uh, the conversation that we have had over here in the House is to really have that discussion in the Health and Human Services Committee. And so I would encourage you to connect with Chair Noor on that piece as we move forward. Uh, welcome, Chair Howard, for uh, coming before us today. We have uh, informational hearing members on House File 302. Uh, we, I just want to make sure that all of our members of the Capital Investment know that we'll take official action of this bill on Wednesday uh, once it's posted in public. Uh, Chair Howard, please proceed with your presentation. Thank you, Chair. And, and I'll try to be brief. I want to make sure we have time for our, our testifiers. But members, uh, as we've kind of heard it with the previous presentation, this really is a build or break moment for our state uh, with the housing crisis that we're facing. Um, over 500,000 Minnesotans are paying more for their housing than they can afford, over 30% of their income. Evictions are skyrocketing, homelessness is increasing, and we have this massive supply-demand mismatch, especially for homes at, for our most low-income Minnesotans. And to, to put this in numbers, right now, uh, there are, for our extremely low-income folks, we have over a 100,000 unit gap in terms of homes that are available. And this supply-demand mismatch, more than any other thing, there are many challenges, but that is really what I believe the main driver when you see the rise in homelessness, the rise in family ho homelessness, the rise in evictions. We need to be building more housing. And meanwhile, last year, the legislature really put up a goose egg when it came to investments in housing. Uh, but we have an opportunity uh, to uh, create a different path forward to unclog the pipeline and then some, and that's what this proposal, House File 302, will do by proposing $1 billion in bonding, $750 million in housing infrastructure bonds, as well as $250 million in general obligations bonds. Um, and, and a few words, especially about housing infrastructure bonds, um, and reflecting on Representative Petersburg's comments about how we need to be looking not just at uh, rental housing, but at home ownership. And it's so true, we need to be in yes and mode when it comes to addressing our housing crisis. And housing infrastructure bonds is a yes and tool. Uh, this is a resource that can be utilized uh, uh, to, to build rental housing. It can be utilized to develop manufactured homes. It can be utilized to build affordable home ownerships. It's one of our most flexible tools, one that has been bipartisan in the, in the past. Uh, and, and truly meet uh, a gap uh, that exists to, to get thousands of units of, of homes and units online. Uh, as the commissioner said, every time we have a round of housing infrastructure bonds, uh, they're basically unable to afford, uh, unable to fund, you know, three out of four projects that are ready to put shovels in the ground. And so we have an opportunity this year uh, to create a different path and get more shovels in the ground. And you know the ripple benefits of doing that are just hard to overstate when you think about how foundational an affordable home is to everything in your life. Uh, you know, to being able to deploy these resources is going to build a stronger uh, economic future, better educational outcomes for our kids, better health outcomes for families. Uh, all will improve if we're able to uh, make these kinds of investments through housing infrastructure bonds and general obligation bonds for public housing. Uh, so I say build, baby, build. And that's what this bill will do. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to our, my testifiers. Uh, thank you, Chair Howard. So first up, we have Kelly Law. Please identify yourself and proceed. Chair Lee, Chair Howard, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you all today. My name is Kelly Law, and I'm a policy and field building advisor with the Metropolitan Consortium of Community Developers, or MCCD. Um, MCCD is an association of 50 nonprofit organizations committed to expanding the wealth and resources of communities through housing opportunities and economic development initiatives. MCCD and its members dedicate our time and resources to address... Kelly, can I have you uh, speak closer to the microphone, please? Thank you. Yes, sorry about that. Um, to address the housing crisis across the continuum of housing yeah. needs. Our members are both multifamily and single-family affordable housing developers. They provide home buyer services, they work in community, and they work to ensure that everyone in Minnesota has a place to call home. With our partners, members, and the Homes for All Coalition, 
we are asking you to support the $1 billion request in bonds for housing this session. The lack of affordable housing options is at the core of Minnesota's complex housing crisis. Simply put, there is not enough housing in Minnesota. Minnesota is also losing its affordable housing stocks at alarming rates, and new construction has struggled to keep up with the increasing need for affordable housing options. We need more than 4,500 units annually of deeply affordable housing at or below 50% AMI. However, we currently only build 550. As the supply of housing is decreasing, the cost of housing is increasing. Families cannot, remain, cannot afford to remain stably housed when 30, 40, 50, and 60% of their household income is drained by their housing costs. In 2021 alone, MCCD members created or preserved over 250 affordable home, on, home ownership opportunities and helped more than 6,100 households with home buyer services. To date, MCCD members have created or preserved more than 28,592 permanently affordable rental homes in Minnesota. We also know that MCCD's membership collectively serves primarily BIPOC renters and homeowners at far, far greater rates than the private market. Of the rental and home buyer households assisted by our members, 73% identify as BIPOC. The consortium has proven that it's shared work to lower racial disparity gaps for cost burden renters in homeownership rates and access to capital is working, but without continued resources from the state, this work is in danger of coming to a halt. We recently conducted an affordable housing pipeline survey to better understand just how many affordable housing projects are waiting in the pipeline. We know that 50% of our members um, have more than 22,360 units of multifamily housing, 350 units of home ownership, and 935 units of housing co-ops that are ready for development right now. With additional funding from the state, these housing projects will move out of the pipeline and into units that will house those most affected by the housing crisis. I cannot stress enough the importance of passing this bill. Housing infrastructure bonds are some of the most flexible state sources of funding to develop and pervert, preserve affordable housing in Minnesota. Since 2012, as Commissioner Ho stated earlier, housing infrastructure bonds have created or preserved over 6,000 units of housing, indicating the huge impact that an additional $1 billion in bonds for housing will have on the housing needs of the state. Additionally, by authorizing half of the housing infrastructure bonds for 2023 and half for 2024, we can create a more predictable and consistent pipeline of funding for current and future housing projects. By passing House File 302 and securing $1 billion in bonds for housing, we can begin to address the lack of affordable housing across the state of Minnesota. The time is now for transformative investments in housing. We know that happy, healthy, and stable lives start with home. Thank you, Chair Howard, for carrying the bill, and thank you to Chair Lee and the members of the committees for the opportunity to testify before you today. Thank you for your testimony. Next up, we have Linda Stage. Welcome to the uh, committee. Please identify yourself for the record and proceed. My name is Linda Stage, Chair Howard and Chair Lee and members of the committees. I thank you for allowing me to testify today. I'm here today as a representative of Aon and have been asked to speak about the importance of passing House Bill, House File 302 this year. In 1996, I went through a very difficult divorce it had been an abusive relationship, and my husband took everything. He took my retirement, he took my savings, um, and when that happened, I could no longer afford the rent on my home. I had worked my entire life as a registered nurse and a nursing instructor, helping to educate members of my community to be caregivers. But when my husband left, that all changed. I began to search for other housing options as soon as I realized I was going to lose my home. I called shelters that told me that I would have to sleep on the floor, but I knew that as a senior woman, my body just wouldn't tolerate that. I'd probably be on the floor the whole time. Um, and I called housing agencies throughout the area, and they were full. Most of them didn't even have a waiting list, but those that did, the waiting list was approximately two years. So I had no choice but to live out of my car. I was lucky, though, it was summer, so I didn't have to deal with the cold of the Minnesota winter. But knowing that a change in season was coming, I was motivated to continue my search for housing options. And through the grapevine, 
an employee at Aon found out that I was homeless and worked with me to get me an apartment. And once I was in an apartment that I could afford, everything changed. Since then, I have had the opportunity to grow. For the first time in my life, I can say that I have friends. And I'm giving back to my community, too. I've helped organize a food shop. I've worked on voter registration and on the census in 2020. Um, I also worked as an election judge in my community last November. My home makes it easier for me to manage my health, too. Um, I have a refrigerator where I can store my insulin, and I have an address where my medication can be sent. And best of all, for me, I have a place for my grandchildren to come and visit me, a place where I know they're safe and where I can host them. I've had the opportunity to get excited about my life again. As a senior, my journey may not look like the face of homelessness, but here I am. I'm only one person out of a growing number of seniors <coughs> facing homelessness. House File 302 would help Aon build more homes for seniors like me. Programs like these are needed because they help people like me to get help in our communities. And thinking back on the difficulties that I've had finding a place, the most wonderful feeling is to know that other people won't have to go through what I did. I ask you to support and pass House File 302 this year it is very needed and would help create more housing for thousands of people struggling maintain, to maintain or find affordable housing. Thank you for the opportunity to testify this afternoon. Thank you, Linda, for sharing your story with us. Next on the agenda, we have Courtney Bailey. Welcome. Please identify yourself and proceed. Thank you. Chair Howard, Chair Lee, members of the committee, my name is Courtney Bailey. I'm here also as a resident of Aon, and I've been asked to demonstrate the importance of House um, File 302. Sorry, forgive me, I'm a little nervous this morning. Well, <coughs> I'm living proof of how important it is to have affordable housing to thrive. I work as a nursing assistant. I'm a mother of three special needs children, and I am like many others, I've experienced quite a bit before I was involved with Aon. I have been, have tremendous illness. I have been jobless. I've been evicted and I have been homeless. I moved here from another state. We live in a state that has just recently cleared a homeless encampment. The very state that model is Minnesota nice. This act of inhumanity, oh, sorry. This act of inhumanity is a small example of the lack of compassion in the housing industry. I myself come from a hardworking family. Both of my parents are medical professionals. My father was a paramedic. My mother was a medical assistant and combined together of 60 years of service to the public. which in turn inspired me to be a medical assistant and later on go to school to become a nurse. Unfortunately, I couldn't afford it, so I had to take a job as a factory worker. That's where I met my then husband, and we lived a very modest life. I became pregnant, and in an instant, we both lost our jobs. <laughs> so uh, we had some friends here in Twin Cities and told us that Twin Cities, Minnesota is an excellent state, it's thriving, warm. So we scraped up what little dolls we had from friends and family members and we took the 16 hour ride to come here to start our new lives. In the beginning, it was very tough. We had to live in a shelter. Shortly after coming here, I found that I was actually two months pregnant with my second child Commuting back and forward um, on a bus was difficult. Living in a shelter was even more degrading. To the point where one night, as I sneezed, <laughs> my water broke. <laughs> I 
had to stay inside of a hotel room for a time being. Eventually, we found um, a little housing apartment. We didn't have much, but we had each other. Later on, shortly after our third child was born, my husband left me. So here I was, one person, <laughs> with three small children with one income. And business, me in business, my landlord evicted me with a one month old baby. So I had to bite the bullet <laughs> and return back to work. Some friends and family got together and watched my children while I worked 60 hours a week until I was able to find a place to live, which was through Aeon. The moment when I was able to get keys put into my hand and my sons were able to run upstairs to their bedroom, their own room where they can play, was the most heartwarming and satisfying experience. An experience that mostly anybody deserves. They hear the joy of my sons when they say, this is our house. But just because I have a home now doesn't mean it's forever. Like many other Minnesotans, we teeter a line of which one paycheck keeps us away from poverty. That type of exhaustion, that type of stress is unbearable at times. So I'm here to ask the committee, my fellow Minnesotans, the individuals that showed me that we can come together as a community with love and respect and compassion for others to have this bill to be signed, that we can have affordable housing, that mothers like me can walk into our doors with our children in just a sigh of relief, that our seniors who have done so much in our community can go home and relax after they've done so much. Our blue collars, our white collars, our everyday workers, we need this. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Courtney, for sharing your experience with us. Next on the agenda, we have Mandy Pant. Please uh, welcome to the committee, identify yourself, and proceed. Chair Lee, Chair Howard, I am Mandy Pant, and I'm sorry, members of the committees. My name is Mandy Pant. I'm a senior project manager with Project for Pride and Living, or PPL, and also serve as PPL's policy, policy committee's co-chair. For over 50 years, PPL has worked to build hope, assets, and self-reliance of individuals and families who have lower incomes by, pro by providing transformative affordable housing and career readiness services. We own and manage close to 3,000, uh, close to 1,600 units of affordable housing in the core cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul, as well as several western suburbs. Close to 3,500 folks live with us every night, nearly half of them children. Half of our units are considered supportive housing, which means uh, people living in them are making 30% of area median income or less, uh, which translates to about $20,000 a year and are likely coming out of the region's shelter systems. I have worked in the housing development team at PPL for over nine years and manage affordable housing projects in all its facets. This ranges from feasibility studies, funding applications, design, financial closing, and construction management. I've also been engaging more and more with the state and local housing uh, policy and advocacy work as policy can often determine how fast a project gets built or even if it gets built at all and impacting the local communities. Uh, we at PPL are very grateful for your work to increase our housing inventory through production and financing tools. Housing infrastructure bonds have been a critical resource that is essential to make new homes a reality in our state. 
One of my most recent projects was Anishinaabe 3 in uh, partnership with the American Indian CDC uh, built on Franklin Avenue in Minneapolis. It completed construction last winter and serves 40 individuals coming out of homelessness and with substance use disorders. PPL's latest development is Bloom Lake Flats on the Lake Street Corridor in South Minneapolis includes 42 units of supportive housing serving um, households and individuals where at least one member of the household is living with HIV and has experienced a housing instability. Both these projects were funded by housing infrastructure bonds and serve critical needs populations. Without HIVs, these may not have been built. The present investment, however, hasn't kept up with demand. Recent estimates suggest Minnesota will need to increase housing production by over 10,000 units a year, and approximately half of those will need to be affordable to address current demand. Without that increase in production, more and more households will struggle to maintain and gain housing stability. These struggles can be prevented with a commitment to more bonds that seed these types of housing developments. As the need for affordable housing solutions grow, so too does our work. However, a recent growth in key cost drivers, most notably in our property taxes, insurance, utilities, and security is making it increasingly difficult to operate affordable housing. <coughs> That's been a growing problem for several years, but the last three years of the pandemic have markedly accelerated these losses. We need to preserve the dignity of our residents and ensure our ability to continue to provide quality affordable housing for our communities across the region. The request before you matches the need. Significant investments in the preservation and development of housing are the only ways to truly address the housing crisis in our state. By passing House File 302 and fully funding bonds for housing, we can begin to meet these needs for all communities that call Minnesota home. At PPL, we firmly believe that housing isn't a roof. It's a floor. <coughs> it's a foundation to building a better life for individuals and families. And as has been mentioned before, we know that families are in, who are in stable housing, their health gets better, their children do better, and they develop their education and job skills. Before I close, I'd like to thank Representative Howard and all co-authors for carrying this bill. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm happy to answer any questions now um, or in the future. Thank you for your testimony. Next up, we have Director Melissa Taphorn, please. Identify for yourself for the record and proceed. Good afternoon, Chair Howard and Chair Lee and committee members. My name is Melissa Taphorn. I am the Executive Director of the Washington County Community Development Agency. And currently I serve as the Legislative Chair for Minnesota NARA, which is the Minnesota chapter of the National Association of Housing and Redevelopment Officials. And that is why we use acronyms a lot in our work. Um, uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk to you today. Um, because this is the first uh, presentation that Minnesota NARO has made um, to either committee, we want to uh, talk about our agency just our organization a little bit and the role of housing authorities before we talk about public housing and the impact of the general obligation bonds on public housing. So, all right. Um, and then I'm going to use the term housing authority generically throughout the um, presentation. However, in your community, uh, our organizations might be branded as CDAs, community development agencies, PHAs, public housing agencies, or HRAs, housing and redevelopment authorities. And on the list of testifiers that included myself and Jill Bankston, unfortunately, Jill is ill today and unable to join us. So you'll just be hearing from me. However, I have Shannon Guernsey, our Executive Director of Minnesota NARO, with me to answer any questions. Okay. Uh, Minnesota NARO is a membership organization for housing authorities and their employees. Um, we provide education and training opportunities for our individual and agency members. Um, and as a group, we really strive to promote strong and vibrant and viable communities throughout Minnesota. 
Housing authorities um, are local government entities that may serve a city, a county, or a group of counties. We're empowered by, empowered by state statute 469 uh, to provide housing, to redevelop blight, uh, and to provide funds and subsidies to expand and rehabilitate housing. So kind of think of us as Minnesota housing on a local level. Um, however, we do a little bit more. Uh, depending on what our needs are. Each housing authority applies these powers in different ways to meet the unique needs and plans of their jurisdiction. Uh, housing authorities act as developers, landlords, lenders, funders, and planners. Uh, we offer a wide variety of programming and invest in our local housing and redevelopment um, in our communities. I've had the honor and joy of working in a number of your districts, actually, over, the career, over my career. I've worked for the cities of Richfield, Plymouth, and Dakota and Washington counties. And as you can imagine, even in those suburban areas, our needs are really different. Um, if you think about those communities, and you can see how South St. Paul might focus on redeveloping their stockyards to make use, better use of those, um, that viable land along Mississippi River. Richfield acquires and bl clears blighted homes and offers the lots for resale to diversify their housing stock, which was pretty much primarily built all at the same time. And um, Plymouth and Woodbury offer down payment assistance programs to ensure the accessibility of lower income and modest income home buyers in their high cost markets. But um, what I want to say is housing authorities have incredible tools. We have successful programs. We sometimes just don't have all the resources we need to meet the needs. Um, and I would um, invite you to take a look a little bit more at our handout um, to explain about more about housing authorities and also to reach out to your local housing authority if you haven't already done so. And then um, I'd like to use this visual to help explain where housing authorities land in the housing spectrum or continuum. Housing authorities can and do um, have a hand in everything from ending homelessness to home ownership. And our largest and well Recognized programs, however, fall into the darkest blue box there, labeled assisted housing. And those are the Federal Home Cho or Housing Choice Voucher Program, or sometimes called Section 8, and public housing programs. In our communities, our units usually have the lowest and most affordable rents. And public housing is a critical piece of that housing continuum, providing homes to our most vulnerable community members, our seniors, children, veterans, and per people with disabilities. Public housing is a vital part of our community. It's a valuable asset and property that is often the pride in, of residents and policymakers alike. Um, you can see on the map, um, public housing is located throughout our entire state. It is home to 20,000 um, households and 36,000 Minnesotan individuals. Um, public housing is owned and operated by 117 housing, different housing authorities. Our apartments vary tremendously in number and size, with more buildings and larger properties in the cities of St. Paul and Minneapolis. Rural housing authorities frequently have uh, fewer build units in a single building, and more than 75% uh, of Minnesota's public housing buildings have 100 units or less, and 50% have less than 50 units per building. Um, Approximately 5% of all Minnesotan residents or renters reside in public housing. The majority of our residents are individuals over 62 years of age, so Commissioner Ho will be happy to know that the federal definition of senior is a little higher, um, and, uh, or have physical and mental illness or disability. Average income is $16,700 per year. That's about 22% of the state median income. So it's really on the really low end. Um, public housing provides that stable housing for those that face the highest barriers. Um, and as you can imagine, there is great demand. Um, we heard um, one of the testifiers um, attest to that in her own personal experience. And um, we haven't been able to build any new additional public housing. There has not been federal dollars for that since at least the 1990s. Um, a public and this is how this works. So a public housing resident pays 30% of their income towards the rent. And then HUD pays us um, up to a maximum on, on, in two different funds. One, an operating fund to pay for staff and operations, and second, a capital fund to pay for maintenance and upkeep of the physical building. We aren't allowed to commingle those funds in any way. 
Um, and on average, what in Minnesota, we collect $635 per unit per month in rent. The resident pays on average $334, and HUD pays us $301. And then on the capital fund, we receive an average of $217 per month. And for context, most monthly family lenders require replacement reserve um, deposits per month of $350 to $500. So um, just emphasizing how we're greatly underfunded there. And then um, years of declines have created backlog in community or capital improvement needs. A survey conducted in 2019 of a subset of our Minnesota housing authorities showed that there was um, $187.7 million in immediate critical needs. And then based on those survey responses, the consultant extrapolated that there was um, an additional amount that totals just under three. $355 million. That was our critical immediate needs in 2019. The survey showed that an additional $450 million would be needed by 2025, 2029. Sorry. Unlike other residential property, housing authorities cannot borrow to make these repairs. Um, public housing prohibits securing other debt on that property. Um, and this, these numbers just um, Again, we're 2019, so this does not take into account the variation in, in pricing, and we're seeing about 30% increase in construction costs. Right. Uh, in order to pay for rehabilitating public housing, we can follow a couple different paths. Paths, this, or, um, HUD provides um, a couple different paths to what's called repositioning your public housing. Basically, we circumvent the under underfunding of public housing by changing it to a Section 8 funding platform. Uh, res residents continue to pay income or rents based on their income, and the housing authority can collect an equal or higher amount from HUD, um, and then they can borrow to um, make those necessary repairs. This is a complicated process and um, can be very beneficial to the property, not all of them, but um, in many cases it is. And we've been very fortunate that the Minnesota legislature recognized this issue, the underfunding, and in certain years um, authorized the issuance of general obligation bonds to fund the publicly owned housing program or POP program. Funds are provided to Minnesota Housing and then they are lent to housing authorities in the form of a 20-year deferred forgivable loan. This has been run through HUD and is um, one way that we can borrow on the properties. Housing authorities couple that POP funds with their capital funds and local equity, if available. And the repositioning op options, however, don't blend well with the POP. On, on, we can't do both for the most part. Um, Commissioner Ho shared a couple of POP loan examples, and I'd like to share two more. Our first example is in my agency. Um, Whispering Pines is a 40-unit 40 um, 40-unit uh, building in Forest Lake. The Forest Lake HRA built this four-story building in 1971 to meet the needs of low-income seniors and people with disabilities. This happened to be the only asset or program that the Force Lake HRA ran, and as federal funds began to decline and the property no longer was sustainable, <coughs> the Force Lake HRA dissolved and returned the building to HUD, where we stepped in. And we, you know, as soon as we took over ownership or went in to do an inspection, we found a number of dis deficiencies. Um, the roof was failing and causing water infiltration. The brickwork and parapet was structurally unsound. The backup generator, roof ventilators, and elevators were out of compliance with building codes, and the interiors had never been updated. The price to fix all of this was just over, under, or just over a million dollars. When the building was transferred, there was a balance um, of three years of the capital funds, and it totaled $150,000. Uh, we approached Minnesota Housing and leveraged their funds with another 474,000 of our local levy funds, um, which at the time was about 15% of the, our annual um, levy, and a significant investment on our part for one property. However, we were in a much better position to do this than the Forest Lake HRA and many of our rural housing authorities, um, which do not have those other revenue sources. Five years later, we took out a second POP loan to make necessary improvements to the plumbing and mechanical systems. We leveraged 288,000 in POP funds with 96,000 of our own capital funds. 
in the past year, we've um, made $166,000 um, of improvements to the community room and kitchen, including accessibility improvements, and those were fully funded by our capital fund. Whispering Pines is now in a position to be able to absorb um, our five and 10 year capital improvements plan with the, within the allocated capital fund that we receive for, from HUD. And then our second example is um, located in Wilmer, and uh, Lakeview is an eight-story apartment building housing 127 households and is over 50 years old as well. Prior to applying for their first allocation of POP funds in 2014, very few capital improvements had been completed in the building. Candy Ojai County HRA has been fortunate to be the recipient of three Minnesota Housing Finance Agency POP awards for Lakeview Apartments. General obligation bonds were crucial in allowing them to complete each project. General obligation bonds allowed them to efficiently use limited federal dollars to preserve and provide decent housing to their lower income seniors, disabled members, and families. Candy Ohio County HRA leveraged each dollar of POP funds with a dollar 15 of their local HRA funds. And their first project um, was to address the failing plumbing system and address health and safety issues for fire safety, uh, asbestos abatement, and um, ADA compliance. There was a leak in the building. All water in the entire building had to be drained to fix the leak because there's no way to isolate the plumbing risers or stacks. The project replaced all building uh, copper water supply lines, galvanized waste piping, and system isolation valves. In addition, compromised fire protection was replaced. There is no floor-to-floor -floor fire protection inside the shaft wall. All the pipes were insulated and fire caulked. Fire rated metal access panels were installed so plumbing valves can be accessed while still retaining that fire wall rating. Um, asbestos um, was abated and then the, um, the accessibility features were made compliant with the ADA criteria. <coughs> This allowed a wheelchair-bound community member who was living in a motel for a year to move into one of the handicap accessible units. The project was completed under budget, and in this case, an added outcome was the reduction of water use in the building. Before undertaking the project, the building used 12 million gallons of water a year, and that was reduced in four years to 5.5 million. Director, can I have you wrap up? Yes, and then um, so there's a number, you know, a number of other things, and I know you have the presentation in front of you on Candy Ojai. So I would just um, emphasize that that 6.5 million dollars in general obligation bonds has been very important to our housing authorities, and most importantly, has been given um, our residents a sense of pride. And we would just uh, express our support for House File 302. Thank you. Thank you, Director. Um, members' questions, let's be succinct so, because we're going a little bit over time now. Representative Carroll. Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, this question is for uh, Chair Howard. And let me first say by letting you know how much I appreciate your leadership and dedication to this issue. You've been an outstanding example uh, to those of us who are coming in from, from uh, municipal positions. So with that said, in Subdivision 2, you reference uh, 50% AMN for your threshold. I dealt with that in, in City Council days in Plymouth, where if people want a TIF, we would require that they set aside so much for affordable housing. Usually 20%, depends. Um, I would try to get 30 or 40 and get a lot of pushback to 50. What is it about 50 versus 30 or 40? I think I know the answer, but I want to hear why it is you have it in your legislation at 50. Chair Howard. Mr. Chair, Representative Carroll. So by this, this would be a policy change piece that, that will end up covering more so in a, when it's in the housing committee, but you're not on our housing committee. So just to share a, a little bit, this change really reflects the desire to target resources to a population that right now um, we aren't able to deploy housing infrastructure bonds to meet this huge need at that 50% AMI or, or below. We definitely need to be targeting resources for folks 30% and below as well. But this change, and especially with if we're able to pass a significant amount of resources, would allow us to kind of do both. Thank you, Chair Hart. Representative Carroll, we will have an opportunity on Wednesday to uh, ask more questions of the Chair, too, when he presents thank you. formally. Representative Erdahl. No, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, just... 
quickly uh, wondering how this bill is going to travel. I understand we're back again Wednesday. Uh, is this going to be an omnibus bill in housing or capital investment? Is it going standalone? Do you have any idea what's going to happen? Thank you for the question, Representative Erdahl. So housing infrastructure bond is under the jurisdiction. The account is under the housing committee. And so our intent is to uh, take out the public housing piece on Wednesday and move the housing infrastructure bond piece to the housing finance committee and then uh, Chair Howard can decide how he wants to proceed with that. And so the intent is to keep public housing within bonding so that the uh, bill doesn't become a, a bonding bill over there in housing. Thank you. All right, thank you members. I really appreciate uh, Chair Howard, you bringing the housing finance and policy committee before us. Uh, for the capital investment committee members, we'll be, like I mentioned, hearing this bill again and taking formal action on Wednesday. And then after that, we'll get a presentation from the Public Facilities Authority and Department of Health on their 2023 intended use plans and less service line removal. This meeting is adjourned.